We were not thinking about radicalization because at this moment in Belgium, nobody was speaking about the Syria, about the young who went to Syria. It was not a daily discussion. Welcome back to CBSN Originals, our series where we take an in-depth look at the major stories we report on at CBS News. Tonight we've been focusing on Brussels, a city in Belgium with direct links to the November Paris attacks which killed 130 people. And to help us understand those links, we welcome a panel of global experts. In London, Dr. Eric Saltman, she is a senior researcher at the United Kingdom's Institute for Strategic Dialogue and Counter-Extremism. Joining us from Paris is Rukmini Kalamachi, a reporter for the New York Times who focuses on ISIS in the Middle East. In Washington is Farah Pandit from the Council on Foreign Relations, also a former special representative to the Department of State on Muslim Communities. And here on set, we have two guests, Richard Barrett, the senior vice president of the Sufan Group, as well as a former British intelligence officer. And last but not least, David Ibsen, the executive director of the Counter Extremism Project. Uh, first, David, to you, what makes Belgium such a fertile recruiting ground for the jihadists? Well, Belgium and neighborhoods like Molenbeek, it's emblematic of uh, a circumstance that we see a phenomenon across Europe where you have uh, immigrant communities, first generation uh, uh, communities, young men in particular, who aren't finding whatever, for whatever reason, the integration, um, the, the brotherhood, the feeling of uh, incorporation in the community within um, that uh, immigrant environment or within that um, urban environment. And they're looking for other things so, to satisfy like, that longing. They're looking for adventure. They're looking for uh, a sense of belonging, brotherhood that they're not getting within those communities. Uh, and they're finding it uh, in the Islamic, in, with the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq. But, but Farah, when you hear the mayor of Molenbeek, as you heard in our story there, almost essentially blaming the fact that there is this rise of extremism on the fact that they have a lot of people who are Muslim living in Belgium and Molenbeek specifically, um, who are from Morocco. It almost seems as if she's explaining the difficulties that we've started to see with the rise of global jihadism on, on the religion. So, Vlad, it's really important to understand this in the context of Europe. There are 44 million Muslims in Western Europe. Uh, and as you know, the generations of Muslims across, including in Belgium, make a difference where they come from and their immigrant stories. But the central point here is the crisis of identity that young Muslims are facing all over Europe. When the mayor talks about their ethnic origin and the heritage from which they come, uh, it, it is actually beside the point. Uh, we have to understand the navigation of identity that has happened from Norway to Italy. Belgium is not similar from the identity crisis that's happening across Western Europe. And it's very important that government officials understand the complexity of that navigation and not blame it on a particular country of origin or a particular experience that they have. Richard, it's interesting, though, uh, it is made more complex in Belgium by the fact that this is a lot of people, and I've lived in Europe for a third of my life. I used to live in Luxembourg, on, which is part of Benelux, called Belgium. Belgistan. And why they call it that is because it's almost like a fractured state. You have multiple languages that are spoken. You have multiple governments, six different governments responsible for uh, all the people in this country. And I learned something interesting on my visit there this time around, that it takes five years to become a Belgian citizen, but you don't have to speak any one particular language. And so in Molenbeek, we met a lot of people that didn't speak. I speak fluent French. I didn't meet anybody that spoke French while we were reporting this story in that community. Well, it wasn't so long ago, of course, that London was called Londonistan, you know, and I'm sure it will go back to Marseillestan and all <laughs> sorts of other things. So I don't think that um, Brussels is particular in that respect. And after all, the sort of vague identity of being Belgian is what New York has been moving towards, you know, the erosion of borders and the sharing of the common identity. And that's something, indeed, I think that many European governments have rather valued. And... As for not speaking the language, yes, of course, I mean, but there are many languages in, in Europe and many languages, for example, in Great Britain, where I come from. I mean, there are schools where you might get 57, 60 different languages being spoken as a mother tongue within the same school. And David Cameron just recently complaining that, um, you know, Muslims who didn't learn English and weren't competent in English shouldn't be allowed to stay there, which is really pretty extreme. It sort of goes, goes against that sort of you know, we're all one underneath type of concept. But I think in, in um, ju just in the context of Brussels, I think we, we hone in on Brussels, particularly because of the Paris attacks, but in fact, there are many, many people who sympathize with, 
what those Mönnenberg people were sympathizing with all over Europe. Uh, but Dr. Saltman, I, I think what I'm trying to get at here is the fact that it's very difficult for young men, young women, anybody to feel as if they are fully integrated into any society if they don't share that one commonality, which is at the very least, you don't have to share the same religion, you don't have to, the same, you don't have to share the same political views, but you should at least be able to communicate with one another to just bring along or bring about that shared sense of community. And you've worked with a lot of young people um, that have, uh, that you that you've tried to help de-radicalize. So isn't that a component that should be studied a little bit more closely? Well, I think some part of actually looking at this component might be a little bit misleading. And actually, if we take a step a little bit further back, then we'll see that actually per capita, we have an even higher number of converts that have been joining the so-called Islamic State. We're actually looking at a trend where these push and pull factors of identity finding are going beyond being a second generation immigrant in a culture that may or may not embrace you. But actually we're seeing this interplay between communities where there have been long standing extremist networks that maybe are on the border fringes of legality that have actually been recruiting large amounts of support, increasingly younger support networks on the ground and online in the top countries where you've seen foreign terrorist fighters and female migrants being recruited. And Belgium is one of those top countries, whether you're looking at those networks like Sharia for Belgium or Ansar al haq in France or al muhajirun or Hizbut Tahrir in the UK. And actually these were groups that were spreading a very strong extremist ideology for many years. And a lot of the waves of recruits actually came from the fringes or even directly within these networks as soon as Islamic State declared that they had a caliphate. Rukmini, to you now in Paris, uh, what has your reporting uh, shown you? What have you learned from reporting on the Islamic State and how they go about recruiting young people across Europe? Well, I think Molenbeek is suggestive of something that uh, that, that shows that there's a cluster effect uh, going on. Um, I've been to Molenbeek more than once, uh, and I was there right after the November uh, 13th attacks. And I spoke to people that knew Abdel Hamid Abaoud, who is considered to have been the operational leader of the November 13th attacks. And what he said is that all of these people at a certain point knew each other. And once you have a critical mass where five people have gone, then 10 people have gone, then 20 people have gone, and they see that these guys go to Syria, and all they have to do once they get to Syria is say one thing, say, say anything from Syria, just upload it on the internet, and immediately they're famous back home. It then has this, this uh, repetitive effect uh, where other people are, are then inspired to go. Um, in, in France, there's uh, one of the famous cases um, is, is called the Artiga case. It refers to the name of really a small village uh, that is in the French countryside, cows, you know, uh, mountains, uh, etc. Uh, and that, again, has become this cluster where we saw Fabien Clon, the man who took responsibility in the audio that came out after the attacks, and, and a whole network network around him just in this little village. Um, if you look at the numbers, though, I think it's important to point out that what the mayor of Bolombeek is saying doesn't really hold up. Uh, there are far more Muslims in America, for example, than there are in Molenbeek. The population of Molenbeek is less than 100,000 people. The population of America is 300 million or more. From Molenbeek, you've had around 85 uh, people that have gone to join radical groups like ISIS, in America, you've had less than 300. Um, and so I, I don't think that the concentration of Muslims is necessarily the thing to look at. Uh, David, the other interesting uh, thing that we learned when we were reporting from Belgium, um, when we met that mother who lost her son. Now, uh, she says that she went to the police and that she told them. Because, you know, a lot of the criticism that people have, especially in this country, about young people who are radicalized is, that, you know, well, parents need to be more involved in their children's lives. They need to know what they're up to. They need to know what they're doing. In this particular case, she knew that her son went from being, you know, a sweet teenager, essentially, to he became reclusive. He be started frequenting a different mosque than the one that she and her husband went to. Um, and she didn't know a whole lot about this mosque. She went to the police and she said, my son is increasingly talking about going abroad to fight for the Islamic State. I can't watch him 24-7. I have to go to, to work, but I kind of sense this. And she says that she flagged it to the police. Um, and then she told us that, you know, a few months later, her son called her from Turkey. He was on his way 
to Syria. Uh, I, I don't think that that would happen in the United States. I think if one of us were here and we called the FBI and we said someone under our roofs is somehow either being radicalized or talking to nefarious people, there'd be some kind of movement. One would think, but uh, the uh, phenomenon of online radicalization, online recruitment in particular, has kind of changed the game in terms of how these things operate. It's very difficult even for authorities uh, to track all the different conversations that are going on online. We know when we were younger, you can do a lot of things in your bedroom that your parents may not know about, even if they're keeping a close eye on you. If you have a laptop in front of you or a smartphone all the time, there's all different kinds of things, conversations that you can, information sharing that you can engage in that your parents may not know about it. Now, the right thing is to alert the authorities, of course. Um, some parents may be scared about their child, you know, going to prison. And parents don't want their kids to go to prison, but they, you know, they also don't want them to go to go abroad and, and, and be killed. But it is important for parents to know when they are observing their, their kids' behavior, thinking about what the consequences of the stuff is that, is that they are severe. In the U.S., for example, people are going to jail for 10 years, 11 years at a time for material support for terrorism, for things that they may not assume are traditional terrorist-like activities, helping people get to the Islamic State, helping uh, to recruit. But in the case of uh, Geraldine, that very tragic case, and her son, I mean, there is clearly a coordination problem uh, in Europe amongst uh, border controls and, and different uh, tactics that are being implemented in terms of stemming the flow of foreign fighters uh, into Syria. It is good. Today we learned that there was the announcement of a creation of a new uh, Europe-wide uh, coordination center uh, to help combat terrorism. And in that announcement, uh, the director stated that, you know, we're facing the biggest terror threat in Europe uh, that we've seen in the last 10 years. And a lot of that is because of the foreign fighter phenomenon. And now the foreign fighters who are returning uh, to, to Europe and the inability of intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies to track them effectively. Uh, and I would, I'm just going to encourage our, our panel, whenever you want to jump in, please feel free to do so um, to respond to anything that somebody is saying. Rupini, the, United, uh, the New York Times uh, and you as your, yourself did a lot of reporting in Belgium. Um, and I think the first hint that a lot of people had uh, in the wake of those attacks is all of a sudden all of us who were reporting on the horror in Paris realized that the these, uh, many of these attackers had connections to Molenbeek. And so we all, yes. as reporters, started to sort of look into what was going on in Belgium, what was going on in Molenbeek. And, and I guess clearly there is something, because even we have a graphic here that shows the number of, of, of foreigners that are uh, leaving Europe to travel to uh, Syria and Iraq to fight. And the enormous amount of them come from Belgium. So what is it? What did you uncover? Mm -hmm. I think it's it's what I said before. I think it's a cluster effect. I think that once you get to a critical mass of jihadists from one place, then other people, it becomes very easy to just kind of bump into somebody at the mosque or on the street who can help you, who can help introduce you mm -hmm. to this other person. And wh whereas in a place that's as vast as America, you're doing it uh, solely online and you might not have any human contact, uh, in a place like Molenbeek, you can actually meet somebody and, 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 and the, then the procedure becomes, you know, much more... Um, much more familiar and much more much more easy to um, to go with. Geraldine, who is the, the the very courageous mother that spoke uh, in your uh, documentary, she also spoke to me when I was uh, in Molenbeek. And the the problem is is the following. Yes, she told the police that her son was radicalized. Yes, she told them that that she thought that he was going to go uh, to Syria. But when he passed through the airport, the young man is 18, so he's an adult. And, um, and there is a problem there, which is that he's saying that he's going to Turkey on a vacation. You know, of course he's lying, but that's what he's saying. And so you have also a, a, a context of, of the law and um, at what point, you know, can authorities reach across that and, and essentially in a sense, if he really was going on vacation, it would be a great violation, you know, of his right uh, to, to, to be held up at the, at the airport and, and, and his mother uh, called. What she told me is had she known that the police would not stop him, she would have staked out, you know, the airport uh, in Brussels day in and day out in an effort to help her child. And in Can I fact, jump in there, maybe yeah, really just quickly on yeah. that point, is that the other problem is that we are seeing a bit of a generation gap with government and security services when they're trying to engage and have monitoring and surveillance online, where Geraldine, the mother in the film, pointed out her son went from what she thought was 
banal passive to radicalized in four months. And we're also seeing that mm -hmm. although that first spark of radicalization really is usually offline, really usually is through an offline social network or another exposure to something, once you do go online, very quickly you can create a self-selective vacuum of information. And we really don't see mm -hmm. any constructive countering that is strategically imposing on that narrative. And so very quickly, that self-selective, mm -hmm. just like all of us, we choose who we follow, we choose what news to listen to and what news not to. And when that goes into processes mm -hmm. of radicalization, we very quickly see somebody that's taken into this group online, that's embraced fully, and also that's able to evade security. So we've seen in other cases where maybe it started becoming harder to fly to Turkey, and all of a sudden the forums were telling people, well, if you take a bus to a country next door and then take a plane, then you can go there or actually come to Libya, not Syria and Iraq, and then you can go in. And actually we're seeing online, they're actually staying one, hep, one step ahead of monitoring and security, and we're not actually infiltrating that effectively. Yeah, so Richard, you want it? Sorry, uh, look, to, Richard first, and then, and then Rukmini, I'll go to you. Richard? Yeah, I think some very important points have been made here. I mean, clearly there must be a proper legal framework in which the police and other security agencies and so on can operate. And uh, indeed, you can be radical. What's wrong with being radical? Most young people, I hope, at some point become radical. But it's, it's making that further step to engage with something like the Islamic State, which is obviously the key problem. And so determining, even as a parent, when your sweet little child has become actually dangerous to your community, I think that is very, very difficult. And I think the, the police and airport, you know, security people like that, quite naturally do tend to take at face value the excuses people give for travel or the reasons they give for travel. But now uh, the Turks, for example, have about 36,000 names on their watch list provided by European and other states, people to look out for. And I think in a way, once you get to Turkey, being interviewed by a Turk saying, OK, well, where were you going and where were you staying and all that, and they know the credibility of the answer. And, and in fact, I believe the Turks have turned back some 2,000 or so mm. people from, from their border who've tried to get in. So that is quite effective, but it does require much more sharing of information, of course, between states. Uh, Rukmini, I'll go to you, and then we're going to take a quick break. Uh, you wanted to add to this discussion. So sure, just to go back to, to what your previous guest was saying, um, the what I've noticed from the cases of radicalization that I've studied is that the radicalization is extremely rapid. Uh, we're talking a couple of months. I featured uh, a young woman in Washington State who was a Sunday school teacher. Um, her home is decorated with Bible verses. Uh, even when I went to see her and she was still in the throes of this radicalization, she still had a Bible uh, on her, on her um, nightside table. And she went from being a Sunday school teacher and a practicing Christian to potentially thinking about becoming an Islamic State bride in, I think, three months. And wow. the, just about the only signs, you know, just, I mean, that, that arc is so quick. Uh, and just about the only signs that she exhibited uh, to her immediate family, because, of course, she was being coached by recruiters who were telling her to hide uh, the, outward signs of, the out, outward signs of her faith, is they noticed an interest in Islam. And then from there, they noticed her practicing some of the rituals of Islam. So she was trying to learn to pray. She was going in the bathroom to wash her feet. Um, and there's a true problem with that, because I think I think that as liberal-minded people, it would, be, it would be very hard to say, your, your child has converted to Islam and is now praying, and oh my god, that's something bad, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, to, to, to make that leap, to just say that because you're seeing somebody practicing the rituals of another religion, that that is therefore reason for concern. And sadly, that is just about the only outward sign that sometimes people see. In, uh, in Belgium, um, Geraldine was telling me that in the case of, of several of the other mothers of, of, these, of these recruits who have now gone and joined Abba Wutzel um, in Syria, uh, some of them were uh, Muslim immigrants, uh, like, like, the mayor, um, like the mayor described, and all they noticed is a little bit more religiosity. Suddenly they wanted to go to the mosque on Fridays, suddenly they were respecting Ramadan and really fasting, and for their Muslim parents, that was a sign of piousness. You know, that was a sign that they were, oh, their, their kids who had been, you know, many of them who had been into drugs and into other problems were suddenly on the straight and narrow. So it, it's, it, it's very confusing and, um, and hard, I think, for families to process and, and, and to try to do something about it. Farah, you wanted to add? Yeah, I would just wanted to say a couple of things. One is we have to remember the local. While we can talk about the cross-European 
cooperation to stop people from crossing borders into other countries. There's something very important that's happening at the local level. And that's where we have to actually engage and understand what's happening in terms of the trajectory of these young people that are slowly becoming radicalized. It isn't just add water and all of a sudden somebody becomes radicalized. There's something that happens that's deep, deep and profound. And more than, more than uh, not, it's their peers that begin to see a change among them. So we have one conversation going on about what parents can do and what parents see. But we also have to think about what peers are doing and how they're influencing each other in terms of what's taking place. So as we think about the conversation that's happened today, I mean, Aaron made some really important points about how we're seeing the change that's happening and how people get radicalized. Let us not forget that it's not just when people are crossing over to the border. It's what's happening along the way, along that conveyor belt, that we, be, we are able to enter. Uh, you know, interface. Uh, the second point I wanted to make is, is a really important one as well. Um, there are mayors all across uh, Europe that have the same sentiments as, as this particular mayor. But there are also government officials who have understood that in the almost 15 years since 9-11 that there is great change that's happened in terms of engaging with Muslims. And what we, when we begin to look at what's happening in Brussels compared to Paris and other cities uh, across Europe, you can see a change of among the way government works with communities to actually find solutions along that conveyor belt. And that's where I really think we need to tilt and, and turn the conversation so that we understand that it's not just one city that is responsible for the radicalization because, Vlad, the key point here, and this is my final point, the, the kids that are getting radicalized are Muslim millennials. They are digital natives. So the fact is, while you can say that many things are happening in Molenbeek, and I have been there, I've been going there since 2007 after the Danish cartoon crisis, and a lot has happened since then. It is not just one city that ricochets across, you know, Europe because people are, are living there. It's because what's happening virally matters not just in Europe, but around the world. And that's the point we have to understand, because that is the demographic from which the bad guys recruit.